on John chapter 5, verses 1 to 21. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. And this is how we know that we love the children of God. By loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God, to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And this is the one who came by water and by blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. We accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God, which he has given about his Son. Anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life, he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray and God will give him life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that he should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was or was born of God keeps him safe and the evil one cannot harm him. We know that we are the children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true and eternal God. Dear children, keep yourself from idols. And that's the way John concludes this first epistle, very interestingly. And so let us have a closer look now at this epistle, this final chapter in our series. I've entitled it, That You Might Know Eternal Life. Now, to begin with, it's a wonderful thing in life to receive assurance about different things, whether this be about the past, the present, or the future. How often do we say and hear words to the effect, boy, I'm glad to hear that, for this news has lifted a great weight off my shoulders. You've often said that. 
And as we come to our text today, where is the end of the Gospel of John declares its purpose as being evangelistic with the words, but these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's John 20 verse 31. Here John's purpose, however, at the end of 1 John is more pastoral. In seeking to give assurance to his readers that they truly know God and have eternal life with the words, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Now there's the purpose right there in this final chapter at 1 John chapter 5 verse 13. So where is at the end of John's gospel it's evangelistic, bringing, trying to bring people to faith. Here it is working from faith and seeking to assure believers that they have the gift of eternal life in their souls. And so where is belief is the goal of the gospel of John? Here in 1 John, it is the starting point for all of those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus as the Son of God. And what these believers need above all else, as we have continued to see as we've worked through this epistle, is the assurance that what they believe in is true in every respect and not false. In fact, the kind of news that lifts a great weight off our shoulders. So let us now see how John achieves this goal and concludes this wonderful letter both to his original audience and for us today. Now, first of all, we are invited to consider faith as the key to victory in verses 1 to 5. Now, in this first section, John now focuses on the relationship of the three fundamental elements so important to him in the knowledge of God. And what are these three fundamental elements? They are faith, love and obedience. Faith, love and obedience. And then in verse 3, John begins his exposition of these three essentials of the faith by telling us expressly what love for God actually means. It is expressed by obeying his commands just as Jesus remained in the Father's love by keeping his commands. That's found at John in the Gospel of John chapter 15 verse 10. So we have a clue there as to what this begins to mean. Just as Jesus remained in the Father's love by keeping his commands and so we keep in the faith of God by obeying God's commands as well. And this includes, incidentally, probably above all else, the command to love one another. That's the new command, in fact, that Jesus told his disciples to keep in John's Gospel. And if we are tempted to think that this is difficult, John reminds us that his commands are not burdensome no doubt reflecting Jesus' words at Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, when Jesus says there, Come to me, all you who are wearied and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so when we follow Jesus, we travel lightweight. We don't travel heavyweight. It is not a burden to follow Jesus. But we might think so in terms of keeping his commands, you see. But his burden is light. This is so through a greater empowerment, I believe, to keep Jesus' words through the Spirit. It's the Spirit that makes this lightweight because when we obey the Spirit, we obey his word and we'll want to keep his word and therefore his words won't be burdensome to us. It's the Spirit that lifts the weight and enables them not only to love his words but to carry them in our lives. 
For as John continues in verse 4 of this passage, for everyone born of God overcomes the world on the basis that he that is within you, and I looked at this last week, and who's he that is within you? That's the spirit, is greater than he that is within the world. That's the devil. And so if we have a greater than he that is within the world within us, we are unable to carry any kind of weight for the Lord Jesus Christ, just as he carried our cross or his cross for us to the very place of Golgotha where he died for us. Also, being born of God, Jesus' followers have a greater desire also to follow and please him. And that should be the case. And finally in this section, Don declares faith. Only mentioned here in all his writings, this is the only place where he mentions the word faith in Greek, as the key to victory. Now, why should this be so? The answer may be found with the way in which John then aligns this victory of faith with the following statement in verse 5, I suggest, which says, and who is it that overcomes the world? As he rounds off this first section. He goes on to say, only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God, thus providing a frame for the opening verse in verse 1 of belief that Jesus is the Christ or the anointed Messiah. So in verse 1 he began with that, proclaiming that we are born of God because we believe that Jesus is the anointed Messiah. Now you see he frames it off in this last verse by saying, he that overcomes through faith is one who believes in Jesus Christ as the Son of God now. So he's both Messiah, that's anointed one, and Son of God. He's come from the very presence of the Father himself. That's the sort of person that overcomes. And I tell you, it takes a lot of belief and insight and understanding to come to that belief. There are many who do not believe in Jesus as the Son of God in our current society. It's a very difficult place to reach. But we know that when people confess Jesus as the anointed one and the Son of God, you're almost there. Because you believe, therefore, that the Father sent the Son to die for our sin upon the cross of Calvary as the Son of God. And so by maintaining their faith that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of God, John's readers will be able to resist the false teaching of the secessionists. And so faith is key because it establishes right belief and doctrine. That's what faith does. It establishes right belief and doctrine, then enabling right love and obedience in response to that belief. And in this respect, one is reminded of the words of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists in the first place, otherwise you wouldn't come to him, must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And incidentally, that's why we go to the trouble to pray. We believe that we pray because God will hear us, and when we reach that understanding that he will hear us, we believe that our prayers will be answered according to his will. And so, for the first time in this epistle, here in this section, John brings together three inescapable qualities of the Christian faith. And they are love, obedience, and faith. And like the three legs of a stool, all are needed for experiencing the fullness of life that Jesus came to bring. But our faith journey with God can easily be replaced by a strong desire to remain within our comfort zones, don't they? And John recognised this 
and reminded his readers that in reality, God's commandments are not burdensome. In fact, in the Old Testament, particularly Deuteronomy, they were meant to be life-giving. Yet you get many people saying that they're, they're, they're really the death knell of Israel. They were never meant to be the death knell of Israel. I want to correct that. I want to turn that on its head and say they were meant to be life-giving in the full sense of the term, the Mosaic law. And Jesus commands, therefore, how much more life-giving are they when he gives his commands to us to follow? So the secret and the means to overcoming the temptation to settle for less are already ours through the Spirit who is within us, who is greater than the one who is in the world, the devil. And the Spirit motivates and empowers us to live to the full for God. And further, each of these qualities is only made possible by God himself. Now, that might come as a, a stark revelation to you. These are only made possible by God himself, for according to Ephesians 2, 8 to begin with, faith is the gift of God, lest any man should boast about his own way of achieving eternal life. Faith is a gift of God there. Then according to Romans 5.5, 5, which I mentioned last time, love is not a human achievement by any means, not this love that God calls us to uh, use and to love by and the love with which he loved us. That is agape. It is from the divine one, that is from the Father, which he pours into our hearts by the gift of the Holy Spirit, we read in Romans 5.5. 5. There's no way we've got that at all unless that's poured into our hearts. In fact, we often pray for loved ones of ours, you know, that God would open their hearts and pour into their hearts his love, his divine love, which we don't have here on earth and they don't have either. But that when God pours that love into their hearts, they will be motivated, inspired to see God in a way that they've never seen him before and maybe to reconcile to each other and so on. That should be prayed more, that God would pour his love into the hearts of people that we love. Followed finally by obedience. Now, this is an interesting one, which according to Ezekiel 36, verses 26 to 27, and Jeremiah 31, verses 33 to 34, the indwelling spirit would enable God's people to accomplish a wonderful feat by enabling us to follow his decrees and laws and to keep his laws. And that's why both Ezekiel and Jeremiah looked forward to a day when God himself would enable us to make obedience possible. It's not wasn't possible for Israel up to that particular point. They failed continuously. But these two prophets here, Ezekiel and Jeremiah, look forward to a day when God would do a new work within our hearts. In fact, a, a, a heart transplant, as radical as that, a heart transplant, and would put his spirit within us, enabling us to keep his laws for the first time. So even obedience, you see, belongs to God and we should never forget that and so faith love and obedience are not only the test and requirements of true Christianity as well as its true expression but by grace they are also gifts of God let us remember that And so I blessed the day and thanked the day when I decided to go the way of Jesus Christ and decide for him because I know that his divine spirit at that same time was at work in my heart and life abating, uh, allowing and making faith and obedience possible. 
Secondly, we are invited to see a threefold evidence as the key to faith itself in verses 6 to 12. Now, this is the middle section of our passage. And in this middle section, we are now presented with a threefold evidence as the key to faith itself in the Son of God. Now, here we also gain a clue as to the nature of the heresy that the false prophets and secessionists were presenting. John begins by saying that Jesus is the one who came, that is, as the sent one from heaven's glory, by water and by blood. But he did not come by water only at his baptism, which would have suited the viewpoint of the false teachers who believed that the Christ or anointing came upon him at his baptism in order to inspire him in his ministry only to desert him at the cross. That's the kind of Gnosticism that John was combating uh, in the first century AD. But Jesus also came by blood, as I pointed out at this table here today, which refers to his death upon the cross as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. This the false teachers and secessionists could not accept by any means. And that's why they left the fellowship, to form an elite group by themselves that believed in a superior form of knowledge minus the cross. But I'm afraid that when you take the cross out of the equation, you take out of the equation the full reason for why Jesus came to this earth to be amongst us and finally to die for our sin. So John then goes on to say that it is the Spirit who testifies to this truth. It's not wonderful to know that the, test, the Spirit testifies to truth and he testifies to the truth of why Jesus came to die for our sins upon the cross of Calvary. Thus there are three that testify, John tells us here, and I find this interesting. There are three that testify. According to the principle laid down, in fact, where? In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 17, verse 6, and chapter 19, verse 15, where it says there that on the basis of two or three witnesses can a case be established in law. You only find that in Deuteronomy. And that's what John is thinking about here. Yes, I need at least two or three. In fact, I'll, I'll give three witnesses here to establish. I'll go to the maximum. I'll give three witnesses to establish the truth of what the Lord is saying here. However, scholars ask the question as to how the water and the blood make up the second and third witnesses, unless they become like Jesus' works in John's gospel, which become silent witnesses to the truth. Uh, John 5.36 and John 10.25 tell us that, that his works were silent witnesses to the truth of his person. Now, this is quite possible. Further, water and blood appear at the cross itself when a soldier pierced Jesus' side with a spear at John 19.34, which I've already uh, uh, made reference to. Now, was John also recalling that event here? So establishing that Jesus came by water and by blood. But a more compelling line of evidence would take us right back to the witness of John the Baptist himself at John chapter 1, verses 29 to 34 is the key passage. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 29 to 34. Here... As Jesus came to John to be baptised in water, John, by divine inspiration and revelation, said when he saw Jesus coming, and he never said this of anyone before, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Thus anticipating the blood of the cross at the very water, of Jesus' baptism. And then John the Baptist gave this further testimony. I saw the Spirit come down upon him from heaven 
he came down as a dove and remained upon him. And then John concludes this key passage by saying, I have seen and testify that this is the Son of God. Oh, he's got it all there in the one package. That's Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 29 to 34. It's all there. And of course, John, in saying that, was a true servant of God, a true prophet. In fact, Jesus said, No man born of woman is greater than John the Baptist. Simply because I feel that John pointed away from himself and pointed to Jesus as the one who was to come. And he did that faithfully as a true prophet. Thus we find here John the Baptist's threefold witness to the water, to the blood, and to the Spirit's witness upon Jesus, confirming Jesus as the Son of God. How's that? Three in one right here in this passage. And this line of evidence would also suit the Apostle John's words at verses 9 to 10 in our passage before us. In terms of God's testimony being greater than any human testimony about God's Son, John the Baptist spoke God's words and witnessed into, his, into this situation, revealing Jesus as the Son of God. How much more should we be prepared, therefore, to listen to and heed the testimony uh, from John that came from God? And finally in this section, in verses 11 to 12, God has given us eternal life as a present possession of believers. Recalling John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And this life is found in his son. Therefore, whoever has the son or believes in the son has life, but whoever does not have the son or believes in the son does not have life. And the Spirit testifies to this truth as the Spirit of truth. There you got it. Finally, we are invited to a new certainty and awareness of God as we finish this passage off today in verses 13 to 21. Now in this final section, John reminds us that we can be sure about the matter of eternal life. Isn't it lovely to be sure about this today? as we walk out of this building today, to say, yes, I do have eternal life. It will never be taken away from me. Can you walk out of this building today and say that? Well, you are blessed if you can. And John tells us here that we can be sure about this. In fact, the purpose for John's writing of this epistle is found here in verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, Jesus, so that you may know that you have eternal life. And John wrote, in fact, let me say, to reassure his readers concerning their possession of eternal life. And I think this is what this total letter is about, reassurance. Now, do we need a similar reassurance today about our possession of eternal life? Maybe there might be some niggling doubt there in our life about that. Well, one of the best definitions of eternal life is found at John chapter 17 and verse 3 in the Gospel of John. Now, this is eternal life, says John. You wait for it. Here's a definition. Now, this is eternal life, that they may know you, that's the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, that's an interesting definition of eternal life, isn't it? It is because eternal life is knowing the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ as the only true God that Christians can have absolute confidence in their assurance and be assured that we're not counterfeit in believing this. Eternal life, therefore, is a personal encounter with the living God, the Father. And that is also affirmed through the incarnation of Jesus as the Son of God. You see, you know both in that process. 
the only true God, the Father, and Jesus Christ, his Son, who came to die for our sin. That combination together is extremely important. And when people say to me, look, I've been searching the world in every cathedral in the world. I've been searching for God. Can you help me? What would your answer be from this? You only have to see Jesus to see God. And your search is finally over when you can find Jesus. Because only Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the one you're looking for the Father, the only true God. And that's my short answer to people who are seeking for God. I say, have you considered Jesus Christ at all? Because that's where God is finally focused. And we can know life in the Son, as 1 John 5, 11 to 13 points out. However, 1 John gives us virtually no clues as to what it means to possess eternal life outside of this text, here in 1 John 5, 11 to 13. But John does give us a number of clues in the fourth gospel about what eternal life means. To have eternal life means to have one's spiritual hunger and thirst satisfied, according to John 4, 14 and 6, 35. It's to be raised up on the last day and to live forever, according to John 6, verse 40 and verses 51 and 54. It's to have the light of life so that one does not walk in darkness, according to John chapter 8, verse 12. It is to have abundant life, John 10, 10. Abundant life means life in all its fullness. To know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent, the one I've just mentioned from John 17, verse 3. And that though we die, yet will we live, according to John 11, verse 25. Finally, eternal life is received through belief. Belief in God's Son at the human level, as texts like John 3, 16 point out. But from a divine level, in 1 John, believers have eternal life because they have been born of God. That's his divine understanding of eternal life in 1 John. You've been born of God. 1 John 2, 29, 3, 9, 4, 7, and here in chapter 5, in verses 1, 4, and 18. So in the end, eternal life is both a present and future possession. Yes, you can have it now, and know it now in all its fullness, and you will know it in the future as well as a gift I suggest to be employed. Now that sort of definition has never hit the track too much. As well as a gift to be employed, especially in our love toward each other within the fellowship of God's children. That's how we demonstrate that we have eternal life, in our love for one another. It's demonstrated there. It's a gift to be employed as much as a present and future possession. Next, in verses 14 to 17, John leads us to a confidence that we can have in prayer. Now, earlier, at 1 John 3, verses 21 to 22, John linked confidence in prayer with pleasing God by keeping his commands. Here, he links it with asking according to God's will. Now, perhaps both of these areas have a common link. For to pray effectively, believers requests need to be in accordance with scripture concerning what pleases God. So I see a link up between those two areas there. Obeying his will and and praying according to uh, praying according to his will and obeying his word. They're both probably linked in the end. Prayer should also lead to life as we pray for brothers and sisters who may have committed an observable sin, and I think that's the kind of sin that John's talking about here, an observable sin that does not lead to death. But there is a sin that does lead to death, which should not be prayed about. Now, Judaism distinguished between deliberate sins that lead to death and unintentional sins that could be forgiven and atoned for, 
A key passage here is Numbers chapter 15, verses 22 to 31 in the Old Testament. But here, in this passage that we're looking at in John, it is most likely that this sin was the sin committed by the secessionists, most likely. That is the sin that leads to death. Who denied that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of God, who came in the flesh, thus reflecting the significance of his atoning death and also disobeying at the same time God's commands and showing no love for true believers by forsaking the fellowship. That is the sin compounded altogether that leads to death here in the context of this passage. Such sin relates to open rebellion, when you think about it, as well as idolatry. Now, it's interesting that John finishes and keep yourself from idols. Why has he said that? Right at the end in verse 21. Because the very sin that the secessionists are undergoing here and committing is both rebellion and idolatry. In other words, they don't want this God, they want another version of God. Which, interestingly enough, becomes John's final word, as I pointed out at verse 21. Finally, John concludes this passage with three great certainties at verses 18 to 20. Isn't it interesting how he had three of different things in these three different sections? Now, there are three certainties in verses 18 to 20. Three great certainties. The first of these is that those born of God will not continue to sin. For the Son of God so guards and protects us that the evil one cannot even get a foothold in our life. Do you believe that? That's the first certainty. And in fact, doesn't that align with Psalm 121 that I read right at the beginning? The Lord watches over us by day and by night to protect us from the evil one and so on. That is true. The second certainty is that we are children of God in spite of the fact that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. And that in itself should give us cause for great rejoicing today. And the third certainty takes the believer to a still higher plane. And what's the third one? It relates to understanding. We all need greater understanding. It relates to understanding which leads to truth. John says the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is the true God, that is God the Father, and we are in him who is true. Now that can either refer to God the Father or to Jesus actually by being in his Son, Jesus Christ. And the final words, he is the true God and eternal life, can refer to either God the Father or Jesus, or both, as at, one, as at John chapter 17, verse 3, and John 14, verses 6 and 9, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then, of course, at John uh, 14, verse 9, he that has seen me has seen the Father. This then throws light on John's final words, I suggest, at verse 21. Dear children, keep yourself from idols. You see, he's been talking about the true God. And that definition I gave you from John 17, 3 is about the true God, knowing the true eternal God. That's God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. There's the clue. So you might say, oh, why is he throwing that in at the end here? That seems a little bit different but it aligns with knowing the true God, you see, right throughout this passage. Dear children, keep yourself from idols, which means false gods here, and not just images, not just graven images. For John has just presented his readers with the satisfying assurance that God is true and genuine and can be trusted. Not like the false deities and insubstantial philosophies which clamour for allegiance in the ancient world. 
including the secessionist false teaching about Christ, which would be tantamount to idolatry. And beside coming to know the true God in increasing measure, the believers have their life in him, for we also are in him who is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. And it's wonderful to know that we can be confident in our knowledge of God today. In a world where Christian truth and values is in the minority. So in conclusion, in his letter, John has sought to give us assurance about the faith in which we stand. And his greatest achievement, I believe, is that he has taken the guesswork out of finding and knowing the true God. Because the true God has been revealed in Jesus Christ. That's where we must lead everyone who's seeking for God. And if this is so, then the true God can be trusted when he brings us the gift of eternal life through the cross of Jesus Christ. So may we continue to rejoice in these wonderful truths and in the knowledge that such a God should bring us a greater understanding about himself and ourselves and our place within the meaning of life. And within that, the knowledge of God's unsurpassable love and provision for our lives forever. And I say thanks be to God for his most wonderful gift. Amen. What we're going to do now is simply...